for people with asthma, uh, it, it's also a particular area of concern. And I know that a lot of you, um, as people with asthma, or if you have an as someone with asthma in your family, or you work with people of asthma, with asthma, um, people are, you know, understandably quite concerned and have a lot of questions about how should they be uh, responding in this situation. Um, What's the best way to manage their asthma? Do they need to take any particular precautions? Uh, should people with asthma be uh, particularly worried, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So I'm gonna go through a few of these um, uh, issues and then there'll be an opportunity for interaction and for um, you to ask some of the, the questions that have been um, buzzing around in your uh, mind at the moment. And looking at the sort of chat that's going on in social media, this is clearly a very, very um, hot issue for um, the Australian community in general, but also for people with asthma. So um, when people ask me or other uh, doctors who are experts in uh, dealing with asthma, they often expect that we have all the answers uh, at our fingertips. And um, I think it's important to say that we can provide you with a lot of what seems um, sensible advice, but like just about every other area of society, we're learning a lot of things um, uh, as we go along. So um, uh, the first thing to say, I think, is that there's um, clearly some concern that people with asthma are a group at increased risk of either contracting the virus or having uh, bad things happen, um, risk of, of, of their asthma getting worse. So, um, but I think you need to put that in a little bit of perspective. It doesn't mean that everybody with asthma is going to have terrible flare-ups of their asthma or necessarily um, have major problems in the months ahead. Uh, we know already from uh, the data that's come out of China and out of Europe that there are certainly groups of people who are more at risk of developing asthma. Um, we know that the older you are, unfortunately, the greater your risk, particularly if you're over the age of 70 or, or 80. Uh, whereas uh, young children, uh, teenagers, young adults um, seem to be uh, much less likely to run into problems. So in considering your individual risk, you need to think about a number of things. Uh, not only do you have asthma or not, but um, uh, how old are you? Do you have other health issues uh, that might make you more at risk? Do you have diabetes? Are you someone who's particularly prone to um, uh, getting infections from some other reason? So uh, it's certainly not a one size fits all situation for people, people with asthma. I think the other thing to say is that it's important to think uh, when you think about your own individual situation, um, where do you fit on the uh, severity spectrum of asthma? Is your asthma mild? Is it something that only troubles you occasionally? Um, is it something that's more moderate and persistent, something that you deal with fairly frequently, but you're able to go about your uh, daily life without major, major problems? Or is it something that really does have a huge impact, um, what we call severe asthma, the sort of people that end up on a lot of medications and are often seeing their doctors um, having flare-ups of their asthma and maybe even being admitted to hospital. So if you've got mild asthma, you probably just need to do keep on doing what you're doing already. And, and to some extent, that, that probably applies ac across the uh, severity spectrum. So I think the first message I'd, I'd give to people with asthma is do what you're meant to be doing in the first place. So um, practice the usual sorts of measures uh, that, that you've got in place. Um, so if you know that there are particular things that you're allergic to that you can avoid, keep on avoiding those. Uh, if there are other track, uh, uh, risk factors, other things that you know trigger your asthma, try and avoid those as much as possible, the same way that you would do um, uh, in, in more normal situations. Uh, if you're someone who smokes, now is a really good time to think seriously about um, giving up um, uh, smoking. 
Uh, I think the next thing to say is around medications. Um, so a lot of people have got questions around uh, what should they do in terms of their medications. And I'll go through some of those uh, at, uh, over a period of time and then uh, we'll have some time to address some of the questions that I can see um, coming through already. So uh, one, th one thing to say is that we're quite concerned uh, as doctors about the use of nebulizers in the setting of the COVID-19 infection. Um, nebulizers can be very effective ways of giving medications uh, to young children or to people who are having a, a sudden flare up of their asthma and we've used um, uh, nebulizers for many, many years. But in the setting of COVID-19 infection, this can actually be quite dangerous if the person um, that uh, is using the nebulizer has COVID-19. We're really worried about the spread of little droplet, droplets of the nebulizer solution that, that might be full of viruses. So what you might notice is if you go to your GP or you go to the emergency department because your asthma is worse than usual, what you'll probably find is that they'll say, no, we don't want to give you a nebulizer. We'd prefer to give you a, a puffer uh, with a spacer. Um, Ventolin uh, hooked into a spacer or one of the other uh, short acting reliever medications like Ventolin, because this seems to be a much safer way in terms of spreading uh, the virus uh, around. So if you use a nebulizer, there's a great risk that anyone in the room with you might, uh, might um, uh, pick up the virus, uh, whereas if you use a puffer and a spacer, the risk is much, much lower. Now you might ask, what about using my nebulizer at home? And I think the answer to that is it depends on who you live with and how your house is set up. If you live by yourself, using a nebulizer to give your medications, uh, it's probably not going to be a problem. It's not going to uh, be a problem for you. But if you live with other people, if, particularly if you live in a in a fairly small house or apartment where it's difficult to get away from other people, I'd be really avoiding using a nebulizer at home if you have COVID um, uh, infection confirmed, or also if you have a what you think is a cold, you're not really sure if it's COVID or not, again, I would, I would strongly recommend avoiding using a nebulizer if at all possible. Now, of course, there'll always be situations in hospitals um, where someone has really, really severe life-threatening asthma, and sometimes we will need to use nebulizers in the hospital situation, but we're, um, we're trying to avoid that as much as possible uh, and in the hospital setting, if we were going to put someone on a nebulizer, we'd probably be asking the staff around them to put out, put on the full protection, the space suits that you might have seen on on TV. And and um, if if you've been used to using a nebulizer when your asthma is severe or you've got um, severe asthma and you often use a nebulizer, really have a think about can you switch over to a puffer and spacer because if you use um, four puffs of Ventolin through a spacer, you'll get almost as much uh, effect as what you will with a nebulizer. So I'm not saying we, we, we think nebulizers should be banned, but we think that people should, wherever possible, uh, avoid them because of the risk of spreading infection um, to other people. Another question that's come up uh, in the situation of the COVID uh, uh, epidemic has been, what about um, steroids? What about uh, inhaled steroids, uh, the, the, the preventer medications that, 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 we, that are really a mainstay of asthma prevention? And what about steroid tablets, things like prednisone and prednisolone? I'll start with the inhaled steroids. And for many of you who've got uh, persistent asthma, you'll be on some sort of a preventer therapy. It might be uh, Simbacort or Ceratide, Flixotide, something along those along those lines. And as far as we can tell, um, these medications do not increase your risk of getting a COVID infection. And in fact, we would strongly recommend that you continue to use these on a regular basis. The, the worst thing that you might do with someone with that, as someone with asthma would be to stop using um, your uh, preventer medications or maybe being a bit forgetful about using them because that really does set you up for the risk of an asthma attack um, and, and the risk of ending up in hospital, uh, which, which none of us wants, wants to happen. So um, 
Inhaled steroids are safe. They need to be taken regularly. If you're a little bit forgetful, maybe you need to um, write on the calendar or program into your phone a reminder to help you remember to take these medications uh, regularly. Um, now, when it comes to steroid tablets, this is a bit of a tricky area because a lot of us, uh, a lot of doctors who look after asthma are worried on the one hand about the, the um, steroid tablets uh, like prednisone and prednisolone. We're worried that these might make people more susceptible um, to developing virus infections, particularly coronavirus. But on the other hand, we recognise that when people have a, a, a bad flare-up of their asthma, uh, a short course of steroid tablets can make the difference between someone uh, being able to ride through the infection relatively easily versus ending up in hospital or ending up in an emergency department. So I think when you sort of weigh up the pros and cons, what, I, what we would be recommending is that, yes, if you do have a significant flare-up of your asthma, be prepared to go on a, on a course of steroid tablets, but keep it short. Keep it to three days or five days or something like that and be in close contact with your family doctor about um, when would be a good time to stop. What we want to really try and avoid, if possible, is for people to be on steroid tablets over a longer period of time. Now... There are a small group of people with very severe asthma who've been on steroid tablets for many, many years and have tried as hard as they possibly can uh, to eliminate or wind back the doses of steroid tablets and have not been successful. Uh, that's a difficult situation. Those sort of people probably should not be um, suddenly stopping their steroid tablets, but maybe they could have a conversation with their family doctor about is, is it possible to try and get on a lower dose because the lower the dose, the greater the risk of, of running into problems uh, while you're on uh, prednisolone. Um, I think the other thing to say uh, is it's very important to have an asthma action plan. Um, many of you will have one of these already, uh, but maybe it's a bit out of date. Maybe you need to review that with your GP or the specialist that you see and just make sure that that's up to date because that can be really important. If you're stuck at home, um, worried that your asthma is getting worse, not knowing what to do, um, your GP might be booked out for two weeks and you're in a bit of a difficult situation. If you've got an, ac an action plan at home that you can put into place, that will often allow you to uh, ride through a flare-up of your symptoms and not have to worry that you can't get in to see the GP uh, for, same, for some time. Uh, and then while we're talking about treatment, um, I just might move on and say a few words about biologicals, the uh, injectable treatments that have really made a big difference for some people in the community with severe asthma. Uh, the recommendation uh, definitely would be that if you're... Uh, already on a biological injection and it's working well and your asthma has improved on that uh, injectable, I would strongly suggest that you continue on the biological. The worst thing that you want to do in this situation has, is have poorly controlled asthma. So if the biological is working well, we think that you should continue on, uh, on that treatment but um, your doctor will be very interested to know if there are very, any unusual things that happen uh, during the course of the coronavirus epidemic. So if, if odd things start happening and you think, oh, maybe it's something to do with the biological or something to do with getting coronavirus, please let us know because we're very much in a learning phase um, and, and we're not 100% sure what's going to happen going through the coronavirus um, epidemic. Um, nearly time to take some questions. Um, I just want to say a little bit about spirometry uh, and measuring lung function. Many of you will be in a situation where each time you, you visit your specialist or see your GP or go to the hospital, um, then uh, you, you have a spirometry test, a breathing test done to measure your, measure your lung function. Unfortunately, in the current situation, uh, most lung function laboratories are either completely shutting down or reducing their activity because of the concerns around spreading coronavirus. Um, 
all that huffing and puffing and blowing and all of that sort of thing, where we're concerned that that sort of activity uh, might allow the virus to spread around. Now, hopefully, uh, as soon as the epidemic um, uh, settles down and we can return to some sort of normal life, we'll certainly be going back to opening up the lung function testing and all of that sort of thing. But at the moment, um, and the only way that you'll get spirometry done is if it's really, really important for an urgent for some particular reason, and if the healthcare staff are quite sure that you don't have coronavirus, because the last thing they want is for someone who's got coronavirus and feels like they've got a bit of a mild cold but are not too sick, the last thing we want is for somebody like that to be um, blowing hard into a spirometer in a doctor's office or a lung function laboratory. Now, um, that doesn't mean that, that you can't measure your lung capacity. If you've got a peak flow meter at home and you're not really sure how things are going uh, with your asthma and your lung function, perfectly safe to do uh, the peak flows at home. But again, I wouldn't be doing it with anybody else in the room. I'd be doing it on your own. Um, uh, it's probably a good point, a good time to mention at this point that you, you're probably moving into a situation where your doctor is doing uh, telephone consultations or video consultations, and so the doctor's not able to uh, examine your chest. Uh, but if you have a peak flow meter at home, you might be able to uh, do some peak flow measurements, and then when the doctor calls you for your scheduled appointment, you can say, oh, doctor, you know, my peak flows are... Um, 400, they're around about what they've been um, for the last few years, and then that's very, very helpful for the doctor to know what your peak flow measurements are. But in general, we're trying to avoid doing lung function testing um, in, in doctor surgeries and in hospitals, um, and, and moving very much to telephone consultations and, and telehealth. Probably one last thing I'll mention, and then it's time to start having a bit of a look at some of these questions, which I keep seeing streaming past on my phone. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me about what to do um, in terms of the workplace and what to do about social isolation. So I, I've had a couple of my own patients contact me because uh, they work in situations where they have quite a, little, quite a lot of contact uh, with the general public or uh, quite a lot of contact with children and they're worried um, what, what should they do? Should they um, ask to stay home from work, etc., uh, etc. et, cetera, et cetera. I, think, I think it depends very much on the individual person's situation. I think um, for people who are exposed a lot to the, to the general public, particularly if your asthma's down the more moderate to severe end of the spectrum, I'd be, I'd be asking your line manager, your boss, if it's possible for you to work in an area of the organisation where you don't have as much contact with the general public, um, I think you've got to manage, you've got, got to weigh up the the risks and the balance and the benefits of of staying in work versus uh, going home. But I don't think that at the moment we're at the stage of saying that everybody with asthma has to stay at home and be isolated. That may be appropriate for people with very severe asthma or uh, for people um, uh, who, who are older, uh, in their 60s, 70s and 80s. But for a young, a young or middle-aged person whose asthma is reasonably well controlled, I think at the moment it's still okay for people to go to work. Now that may change. Uh, uh, at the moment in the UK, for example, they're suggesting that uh, people with asthma really um, self-isolate and stay home as much as possible. Um, I don't think that's probably necessary at the moment, but you're going to, you may need to have a conversation with your doctor and weigh up um, what's the risk associated with your job. Are you working in an emergency department? Um, are you working in a childcare centre? Um, how bad is your asthma? Are you someone who's prone to getting bad attacks? Uh, versus are you working from home? Are you in a back office of an accountant's office where you really are able to pr process, um, uh, sorry, practice social distancing and your exposure to uh, the outside um, world is, is, um, is fairly minimal. So I think what, what weigh up all the factors, it, there's not gonna be a one size fits all uh, answer for everyone with asthma across Australia. So look, I think I might um, stop at that point. Um, 
uh, and start to address some of the questions. I think there, there's more questions than I can keep up with at the moment. Um, Jez has just asked a question about what about children with severe asthma? Look, I think that's a, that's a particularly challenging area. I think, um, as you know, most children now are, are at home uh, with their families, which means that they're going to be having uh, much less exposure to uh, their friends. Um, they're not going to school, which is a great thing. So that, that does give a measure of protection, but it's still gonna be important for them to be uh, using their med regular medication, staying in contact with their um, healthcare provider, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So someone, yes, yeah, so someone says, says uh, Christine says uh, that she's got a number of concurrent uh, breathing problems, not just asthma, but some other problems as well. And she's scheduled to have bronchial thermoplasty and can't have it. This is a really challenging uh, area. Um, Part of the, there's a number of issues going on there. One is that um, most, uh, a lot of surgery has been cancelled in, in, in our hospitals. Um, that's one issue. A second issue is that if people do have bronchial thermoplasty, um, they're more prone to have, uh, for their asthma to be temporarily get a bit worse um, for a few months afterwards. And I, you know, it's always hard in an individual situation, but my feeling would be, um, I'd be deferring it for a little while till maybe after the um, coronavirus situation is settled because the last thing you'd want would be to have a successful surgical procedure but then have um, a bad virus infection uh, post, uh, you know, in the post-operative period. Uh, Florina has asked about chronic bronchitis. Uh, that's a bit of a challenging issue, but I think... I think um, it's worth thinking a little bit on the positive side. So everyone's focused at the moment around coronavirus and worried that they might pick up the infection. But with all the social distancing that's going on and with all the um, focus on hand hygiene and people uh, avoiding big groups and all of those sort of things, I think this is actually going to have a lot of knock-on positive effects for a whole lot of other um, infections that people might otherwise get. So. We may see less flu this year just because people are having less contact with other people and they're washing their hands. We may see less bacterial infections. We may see less common cold infections. So there, there may be a little bit of a silver lining to the coronavirus uh, epidemic. So sure, you've got to monitor your own situation. Um, if you are prone to cough up phlegm a lot, have a look and see, is it changing in colour? Is it going a yucky colour? Um, is it is it increasing in volume? Maybe you might want to talk to your family doctor about having a reserve supply of um, antibiotics. Um, you know, just in case you get you, you do get bad and it's difficult for for you to see the doctor. Um, someone's asking about taking extra vitamin C. Hmm. Um, personally, I'd, I don't advise it. I think it's far more important to um, have a lot of fruit in your diet and, and vitamin C rich foods because what we know is that things like oranges and capsicums and um, things that have got vitamin C in them have a whole lot of other health benefits. And sure, vitamin C may have some slight benefit, but um, I'd be taking a food that's rich in vitamin C rather than the vitamin C itself. So Christine's um, said, what about flu vaccines? Um, she's got uh, steroid-induced diabetes and is worried about uh, having the flu vaccine. Look, um, a difficult question, uh, but personally, I'm recommending all my people with asthma, particularly my people with severe asthma, that they have a flu shot this year. Um, even though I'm hoping that there'll be less flu uh, than last year, I don't know that for sure. And the last thing that you would want would be a flu infection and then coronavirus or coronavirus and then a flu infection. So look, I'd be talking to your doctor, but in general, my preference would be that you um, have the flu shot. So Joe's asking about availability of Ventolin. Oh, that's a tricky one because uh, as you know, there are a lot of people buying up and stockpiling Ventolin and it's very hard. 
there are other ways that you can get the same benefits. So for any of you that are taking Simbacort, that has a um, an immediate um, effect of opening up the airways in your in, in your lungs. So if you've got Simbacort, you can use that as a Ventolin substitute, uh, but talk it over with your doctor. Let's have a look. Someone's got, I can't see all of these questions, unfortunately. Let's have a look. So um, someone's asked about uh, Bernadette it is. I can't see all of your question on my phone. Sorry, Bernadette, but um, you've had a lot of issues with severe asthma and repeated virus infections, and I guess you're certainly the sort of person who I would think is at risk of having problems um, during the the epidemic. And I'd be thinking um, if you're not doing it already, you're the sort of person who um, should be staying at home as much as possible, um, making sure you've got an action plan, staying in close uh, contact with your, with your doctor. Um, if you do isolate at home, your chances of picking up uh, virus infections become very, very small because if you're not having contact with other people, um, you're much less likely to um, uh, develop infections. Bernadette, um, you've also mentioned that you're on a new drug called Mepolizumab. That's one of the biological injections that I was talking about earlier on. Um, for, for at least one of the biologicals, we know that it actually reduces the risk of, bi of virus infections and we're hoping that some of the other ones that have just come on the market will also protect against virus infections. Certainly the better your asthma is controlled, the less likely you are to have trouble. So I'd be strongly encouraging you to keep on the uh, mepolizumab. So Lisa's uh, got a terrible persistent cough um, yeah, that's a bit hard to sort out just in a sort of two minute Facebook uh, discussion, but have a talk to your doctor. There are There is a phenomenon of what's called post viral cough uh, that can, that GPs see a lot of people who get a virus infection, the virus goes away and they cough for weeks and weeks afterwards. Not easy to deal with, usually it gets better uh, by itself. Uh, which monoclonal? So there's three biologicals available in Australia at the moment, one called Zolair, one called Fasenra, uh, and one called uh, Nucala, which is also uh, Mepolizumab. Um, as far as we know, as I said before, if you're doing well on the biological, you should continue to take those. Uh, and we're hoping, what, what, what we think might happen is that um, as your asthma control improves, you'll be less likely to run into troubles with uh, uh, virus with virus infections. Mm. How many asthmatics have had a cough for over a year? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I think there's a lot. <laughs> I think uh, it's it, it's not a simple thing. So sometimes the cough is continuing because it's an asthma related problem. Sometimes it's because of what I said before, post viral cough. Sometimes it's due to the fact that you've got a post-nasal drip or you've got reflux or something like that. So there's a lot of reasons and you really need to talk it over with your doctor. So Laura is asking about um, uh, asthma and pregnancy. Uh, does uh, asthma get worse in pregnant pregnancy? And that, that is certainly the case. We think that about a third of people with asthma uh, will get worse when they're pregnant. About a third curiously get a little bit better and about a third stay the same. Um, if you've noticed that your asthma is a little bit worse, again, very important that you stay in close contact with your doctor because having good control of your asthma now is going to set you up for a more straightforward labour and it's actually better for the baby. The worst thing for the baby is for your asthma to be poorly controlled. So, um, important to continue um, on your uh, preventive therapy. So Misty's asking about benrolizumab. So that's the third of the monoclonal antibodies that are available in Australia, also called Fasenra. Um, as I said before, um, if you're on that and you're doing and it's doing well, definitely continue it. And I think um, we'd hope that it will reduce virus infection risk. Okay, the questions have slowed down temporarily. Uh, 
Um, the other thing I was going to say is that the um, asthma handbook produced by the National Asthma Council has just been updated with some advice about um, what to do uh, in, in the situation of asthma and they're going to try and keep that regularly updated. I understand Asthma Australia will be sharing that link uh, with you um, so that you can find the link to that on the... Um... Yeah, so, <laughs> so Linda's mentioned that liquid Ventolin is available. It certainly is. Um, the problem with liquid Ventolin is that because it gets absorbed um, through your stomach um, and, and gut, um, it goes into the whole body rather than just into the lungs. And so some people will get um, a little bit shaky on liquid Ventolin. They might find their heart races, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, we sometimes use it in small children, but it's not, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword and just be aware that you might get more side effects if you take it by mouth rather than inhaling it. So Joe said, we've had dust storms, fires and constant drought. <laughs> I can't see the rest of your question, sorry, Joe, but it certainly has been a challenging last um, six months or so for the community in general and for people with asthma in particular. Yeah, good question. So Sarah, Sarah, I see your question. Um, Sarah's asking, are the biologicals immunosuppressant? That's a really good question. So um, the short answer is probably not. And, and the reason I say that is that the biologicals target a really, really specific little pathway in the immune system that um, uh, is responsible for allergic inflammation, but kind of leaves everything else of your immune system pretty much untouched. Um, the problem with um, steroid tablets and steroid injections is that they're a bit of a bit of a, a machine gun or a blunderbuss in that they suppress just about everything in the immune system, in, system, including the ability to fight off infections. So the biologicals, I think one of the reasons we, we think they're so appealing is that they target just the pathway that causes that allergies and the allergic inflammation, but allows your immune system to fight off infections. Uh, Misty says, uh, if you're having an asthma attack, is it best to go to emergency or call an ambulance? Gee, that's a bit of a tricky one. Um, probably call an ambulance uh, would be the simplest thing. But just, I know some asthma, asthma attacks can come on very suddenly, but often they'll build up over a period of a few days. So if you've got an asthma action plan, that will allow you to kind of try and get one step ahead of the game and nip, nip the flare up in the bud before it gets to, that it's so bad. Uh, Lorraine's asking, um, how can you tell if it's asthma or COPD? A bit hard to explain uh, in a short period of time. That's usually done with, with um, breathing tests at your doctor, but at the moment that's a little bit hard to get organised. And um, yes, so Andrea is asking, when should an asthmatic be prescribed the biological injection? So Andrea, these are medications that are really for people right down the severe end of the spectrum who've tried all the standard inhaler therapies, uh, the, you know, Simbacort, Ceratide, those sorts of things. They're very expensive medications, but in the right patient, very, very effective. But at the moment, you can only get them on pharmaceutical benefits if, if uh, you've got quite severe asthma. In the future, they may be good for people with more moderate disease, but at the moment, um, they're really just for um, very severe asthma. Uh, Christine, we've seen a few questions from you. Um, so Christine's asking about being on uh, long-term antibiotics um, and, and, and is that bad, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there are a very small group of people uh, with bad asthma and sometimes with bronchiectasis who get lots and lots and lots of infections where your doctor will sometimes put you on a small dose of antibiotics for a long period of time. Personally, I do it only occasionally and my advice is that is just to do it over the winter months when, um, when, when the risk of infections is at its greatest. So I really like people to have a summer holiday from uh, antibiotics if at all possible. So if you're the sort of person who might benefit from long-term antibiotics, discuss it with your doctor, maybe do it over the winter, but most people with asthma are not going to need to be on long-term antibiotics. We worry about the risk of um, antibiotic resistance and that's something that we need to be um, very conscious of. 
Layla has a son um, with, with IgA deficiency and anaphylaxis. Um, I can't see all of your questions, Layla, but this sounds like a quite a complicated uh, issue. Um, I hope that you have an immunologist um, looking after your son. If you don't, I'd be um, maybe talking to your GP about it, getting a referral um, uh, to uh, an immunologist. So Nick is asking about how to tell the difference between an asthma flare and COVID. Now that's a really good question. Um, I guess uh, COVID tends to cause symptoms that are very much like the common cold, at least in the, in the sort of mild phase of the illness, um, sore throat, runny nose, cough, um, and a fever. Uh, how do you tell if it's making your asthma worse? Well, you go back to the usual principles. Are you wheezing more? Are you waking up at night short of breath or tight in the chest or wheezing? Are you getting out of breath doing your usual activities? If it's mostly cough, sore throat, runny nose, it's probably mostly in your um, upper part of your airway rather than down in your lungs. But if you're not sure, certainly go and see your doctor. And there are definitely going to be, uh, over the coming months, there are going to be people who have both, who have both a COVID infection and a flare-up of, of their asthma at the same time. Uh, Kate, I can see your question about Facenra, but can't see all of it on my screen. So sorry, I can't say, can't say too much. So Bernadette's on Theophylline, um, it says 25 milligrams a day. I wonder if maybe it's 250 milligrams a day that you're on uh, twice a day. Um, so Theophylline doesn't get used very much. It's quite an old medication. Um, when I first went to medical school, a lot of people with asthma were on Theophylline. Nowadays, much less because it can have side effects, can up, cause stomach upset and various other things. and. A lot of the newer inhalers have got um, medicines in them that open up the air passages, things like Ceratide, Simbacort, Brio, those sorts of medications. So um, my advice to people is that have a try on Theophylline, but mm, it, it doesn't replace the, the usual inhalers that I've just mentioned. Uh, it sometimes helps as an add-on treatment, but certainly not not, wouldn't be the first line treatment. Um, you'd normally find out within a couple of months whether it was doing you any good. Yeah, so Andrea is just asking about nebulizers uh, versus puffers and spacers. I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier on, um, that with the COVID epidemic, we're really trying to discourage the use of nebulizers uh, for asthma. Uh, not because they don't work, but because if someone who has asthma has a COVID infection, there's a serious risk that little droplets of the COVID virus will be spread um, around the room. So to anyone else who's in the room with them, whether that's a nurse or a doctor or a family member or a friend or whatever. So if you come to hospital with asthma, the likelihood is you'll be treated with a, a, a puffer and a spacer. And if you give enough of a puffer into a spacer, you can effectively get the same beneficial effect without the risk of spreading um, aerosols of virus all around the room. Uh, so Emily's asking her son's been taking antibiotics for MRSA flare-ups. That sounds a little bit unusual in in a child. Um, 
yes, it could be made worse if they got a COVID infection, but I think in terms of what can you do to prevent it, it's the same sort of um, advice that we've been giving them around hand hygiene and social distancing. Sarah's asking about Zolaire and is there any risk? Um, probably not. And in fact, Zolaire was one of the first of the biologicals, the injectable medications that actually showed a, a big reduction in virus infection. So there was a study that was done in the USA a number of years ago now, uh, and they started treating um, people with asthma just before everyone went back to school and where there, where there was normally a big flare up in cold infections. And they found that the people that were treated with with Zola, not only did they have less colds, but they also had less colds that then led on to um, a flare up of asthma. So, um, like all medications have have a small degree of risk, but I think in the current situation, if I was on Zola and my asthma was doing well, I'd definitely be continuing it. So Misty's asking about, is there any information about people with severe asthma catching COVID-19? Um, it's too early to say in Australia. I think in the, in the next uh, month or so, we're going to start seeing reports of uh, coming out of the UK, Spain and Italy as to what the situation is. Um, but at the moment, I don't know the answer to that. So Cherylee's asked, she's lost her voice um, and it hasn't gotten any better and is wondering if it's her could be related to medications. It could well be. Um, it may be that there's some powder from your inhaler building up in your throat and you might be better if you're on a powder inhaler to switch over to a puffer and spacer. So see your doctor um, and, and, and have this looked into. Um, you might need to have an ENT specialist have a look at your vocal cords, but often it's a simple matter of uh, fixing up inhaler technique and maybe using a spacer. And Nicole's asked, are people with asthma more prone to COVID? Um, we don't know at the moment, but what we do know from uh, many, many years is that people with asthma get more virus infections. So probably they're more prone to get COVID. Um, but we just don't have very much um, data at the moment. Yeah, Andrea's been asking uh, whether the comments that her vocal cords um, got affected by um, an inhaler that she was on before and she's now been switched over to Alvesco. Um, Alvesco is quite an effective drug and one of the it's often used in people who have uh, vocal cord problems with some of the other inhalers because um, it doesn't. It only gets converted into an active drug when it gets down into the lung, so it seems to be less likely to cause problems with the throat and and voice box. So uh, yes, it does seem to be an effective drug. And if one of my patients who was taking Serotide or Simbacort had voice problems, I'd I'd be switching them to to Alvesco. So uh, RJ's uh, asking about his daughter who's got asthma. She's only about able to get one puffer every 10 days with a script. I'm assuming that maybe that, that you're referring to Ventolin. And, and if, you're, if your daughter is going through um, a Ventolin inhaler or an Asmol inhaler in 10, on, in 10 days, she probably really needs to be on some sort of preventer inhaler. So have a talk to your doctor. Um, she, she, yeah, she's probably going to need to, to take some sort of preventer inhaler rather than relying on the Ventolin. Uh, Melanie's asking, will the availability of inhalers improve soon? And, and I think, yes, that's absolutely correct. And someone from Asthma Australia has given some uh, further advice to you, Nicole, uh, and a link through the website. So Jennifer, you have a four month old daughter. Um, I hope she's a lovely, lovely baby. You're worried about whether, what her risk is of getting asthma if both of her parents have asthma. So um, it's not invariably going to happen. Um, certainly her risk is greater than if she didn't have any parents with asthma, but it's not invariable. Um, 
I can't give you a specific number and she's very unlikely to, to develop asthma at this stage. If it is gonna develop, it's probably gonna be a little bit further down the track. Yeah, Nikki's asking about, um, wants more information about side serious effects from um, coronavirus. I think uh, there's gonna be so much data is gonna become available. I think the, one of the problems at the moment is that the healthcare staff in, um, in Europe uh, and the UK are just so overwhelmed looking after their patients that they're not really, um, uh, not, not really sitting down in front of a computer writing articles about what's going on. But I think that we, we can expect to see a lot more, um, a lot more information coming out over the weeks and months ahead. Someone's asked um, that their Ventolin inhaler doesn't um, seem to be working as well as it used to be. Now that sometimes uh, is because there's an issue with the way you're using it, but more often it means it's a bit of a sign that your asthma is maybe a little bit worse than it has been in the past. And again, um, you might need to see your doctor, you might need to go on a preventer inhaler, you might need to think about trigger factors and whether um, there's something that you can do to change your lifestyle. Andrea has asked about reflux and asthma. Can one trigger the other? Uh, definitely can. Uh, there are a lot of people with asthma who have reflux and it's usually worthwhile um, trying to treat the reflux. Doesn't always make the asthma go away, but certainly worth, worth doing it. Yeah, someone's asking about backing off on the use of their preventer inhaler um, because they're worried about availability. I'd be trying to avoid doing that in the current situation. You wanna make sure that your asthma is as well controlled as possible. Yeah, someone's asking about getting pain in the diaphragm with major asthma attacks. Sometimes that can happen if you cough a lot. Um, yeah, absolutely. Look, I think I'm gonna wrap up at this point because uh, it's 9.30 and I've got a lot of other work uh, to do. Someone's had a, uh, someone, uh, Cherie's asking about uh, the link between vocal cord dysfunction and COVID, so that, given that COVID seems to affect the throat. That's a really good question, Cherie. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I could well imagine that if you've got, if your vocal cords do tend to go into spasm and tighten up, COVID might well make that worse, um, but, um, I don't think anything's been published about that. Uh, Mitch is asking about stress as an asthma trigger. Uh, yeah, definitely. And I think um, all of us are going through a, a, a bit of a topsy-turvy time. We're all feeling a little bit stress, stressed. And I think it's really important that each of us um, think about some strategies to manage that because, you know, uh, coronavirus is causing everyone to worry in all sorts of ways and if you spend all time all your time sitting in front of the tv hearing bad news stories that doesn't really do uh, your mental health any good so make sure you have a bit of a break from your screen have a break from the tv um, go for a walk um, spend some time with your family uh, meditate pray um, do some relaxation, some exercise, all of those sort of things to, to make sure that you don't wind yourself up into a state where you're so anxious about coronavirus that um, the anxiety becomes worse than the coronavirus. Yeah, Lynn's just asked, she's had asthma most of her life and is worried if she gets the virus, it might make her asthma worse. Very good question. I think that's why it's so important to um, make sure that your, ap your asthma care is um, really nicely tuned up. Make sure that you've got your asthma action plan, um, a, a, a good GP that you can rely on uh, and practice the social distancing and the hand hygiene and all of that sort of thing. So I'm gonna sign off at this point. Um, it's been great sharing with you. Um, I apologize if I didn't get to everybody's questions, but I think there'll probably be a whole lot of uh, chat going on on the Asthma Australia website and stay well everyone. Bye for now.